I'm very glad to be here. Um, it's only my fourth time in India and it's always been a very short trip every time. Uh, so I haven't seen much of the country, but uh, I've always enjoyed these short stays and I'm enjoying this one as well. Now, um, okay, so I will, what I will be doing today uh, is going to be more theoretical than methodological. So there is not that much method that I'm going to talk about, much more theory. Uh, I'm just going to give my general take on the field of pragmatics. And uh, then tomorrow will be a session that is almost exclusively devoted to methodology and then specifically methodology for one specific purpose, namely for the study of language in public discourse. Um, and it is as, uh, as Jenny said this morning, so there is never just one methodology, you know. Um, you really have to look very carefully at what it is that you want to study, what the data are that you can get, and you have to adapt whatever methodological means are available to then try to get answers to your questions in connection with the data that you have available. Now, okay, but let's start with the uh, theory, with theory, okay. What I'll be going through is, uh, first of all, I'll say a couple of very general things about pragmatics and language use. Then a very general thing about what I see as the basic structure of a pragmatic theory. Um, and these are things that, uh, for those of you who have, had a, ha who have been able to have a look at the Understanding Pragmatics book that was made available electronically, um, there will be nothing new there. And that's why I will also do this very rapidly, because it doesn't really make sense to spend much time on things that you can also read. Then the problem of implicitness is something that I will also pass over relatively quickly uh, because most of the day and most of the specific pieces of information that you need for understanding the issue of implicitness and implicitness is really one of the notions that's at the center of what we are dealing with when we're dealing with language use. Uh, I will pass over this very quickly as well because there are very good resources uh, for studying this phenomenon further and also I know that I heard that Rukmini is going to talk more about one specific type of implicit meaning, implicatures. Uh, Jan Ola is going to devote some time to uh, the notion of implicitness. So I will also do this very rapidly. And then what I want to come to is this notion of meaning potential that you, that you see there. Uh, which you have not been able to read about, I think, but which is a notion in terms of which I am more and more beginning to conceptualize the field of language use. And then uh, if we still have time, uh, then we'll get uh, down to the issue of how to map meaning potential, but okay, I don't know whether we'll get that far. There's not that much time. Okay, so let's start. Um, first of all, if there is... Um, anything uh, in relation to a definition of pragmatics that I want to be quoted on, that is these two sentences. First of all, as a field of linguistics, pragmatics is simply the science of language use. You can quote me on that. Second thing you can quote me on is, as the science of language use, pragmatics can never be simply linguistics. So that's because of what I said very briefly yesterday. Okay, if you want to deal with language use, you're dealing basically with everything that is involved in language use. And it involves the human brain, it involves cognitive processing, it involves the social context in which uh, talk is being used, it involves cultural backgrounds, and all of that needs to be referred to. And uh, all of this together, captured in this uh, definition which Rukmini also projected this morning, namely, so what linguistics pragmatics is, is basically the interdisciplinary cognitive social cultural science of language use. Now, that having been said, you have to start asking the question, of course, now what is this thing language use? Or in other words, what do we use language for? And what we use language for is basically something very, uh, very messy, hmm? making meaning. 
making meaning. That's what we are using language for constantly. And this is usually done in an interactive process, different people collaborating in this process of making meaning. And then if you try to um, go down to the, the nuts and bolts of what it is that's being done, then you must say, well, what is actually done in this general process of trying to make meaning by means of the use of language is that you're making all kinds of linguistic choices. So choice making is of the essence, both at the, and this is very important, both at the end of the production of linguistic utterances and in the comprehension of linguistic utterances. In both areas, both when producing and when understanding utterances, what you're doing is you're making all kinds of choices. And you're making cho and to make sense of this choice making, there are a couple of notions that for me are essential and I've been repeating this for the past 30 years probably and I, I don't manage to change my mind on this <laughs> so I just keep repeating it. So this choice making is done from a variable range of options. That's why variability is an essential notion for the field of pragmatics and as soon as variability is lost sight of you're on the wrong track. Variability which is situated at every level of linguistic structuring so it is situated at the level of language choice, situated at the level of the choice of specific codes within a specific language. It is situated at the level of all the, all the phonetic, phonological, grammatical uh, choices that are being made in this process of uh, using language. And, as soon, and at all those levels, there is a huge amount of variability to be taken into account. Variability, which really goes as far, so far, well, I, of course, I don't have to explain to Indians how much variability there is. We just heard this morning that there are 800-something languages available, and within those 800-something languages, many, many different codes, probably, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I don't have to explain that to you. But this variability really, uh, when it comes down to it, goes as far as to say that just about everybody uses a different language. So we all come into the use of a specific language from a specific background. Um, and uh, there are, of course, convergences. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to use language efficiently. There are lots of convergences. But if we lose sight of variability, we are on the wrong track. Now, the second notion to be taken into account is that this choice making from this variable range of options is not done in a mechanical manner. It is not so that you have fixed forms which have fixed functions. No, just about everything, every choice that is being made is negotiable. So choices that are made are interpretable in a variety of ways and interpretations then have to be negotiated about and form the basis of further choices that are made and so on. So negotiability is something. And then in spite of all the variability and the negotiability that is involved, you may wonder, well, how is it still possible to use human language for more or less efficiently for specific communicative purposes, well, we, um, the only answer we can give to that is, well, to say that uh, there must be an enormous amount of adaptability involved. So what is happening is that, this, that the choices that are being made are getting interadapted with communicative needs and specific tools that are being used. And, uh, but this is not an operational notion. It's a purely theoretical notion which, um, <clears throat> which you cannot use like certain other notions in the field of pragmatics, like in pragmatics there is, which some of you may, fam may be familiar with, there is, for instance, a field which is called relevance theory. Well, within relevance theory, the notion of relevance is used as an operational notion to explain things that are specifically happening in specific forms of language use. But adaptability is not a notion like that. It is only to be situated at this very general level, as uh, something that we must keep in the back of our minds to be able to understand how all of this is possible. Now, all of this is uh, possible thanks to the fact that we can make full use of the reflexivity of the human mind. We can use 
meta-pragmatic awareness. What does that mean? That means that whenever language is being used, uh, we are constantly monitoring what is happening. So, for instance, before I can start talking here, I must make, for instance, hypotheses about what it is that is already in your heads for me to be able to make the appropriate choices to make sense to you. And I'm going to miss the target on a number of occasions because I simply don't know what all of your backgrounds are. Hmm? I don't know that. So I have vague ideas about what your background may be and on the basis of hypotheses that I form on the basis of that, I can make certain types of choices in deciding what it is that I want to say here and how to say it. Okay? Now, um, this, uh, well, if you're um, familiar with the work of Michael Tomasello, uh, who is a cognitive anthropologist, um, well, he would describe well, he starts a book which is about the cognitive basis of human culture, if I remember the title correctly. And he starts the book basically with a puzzle. Uh, and the puzzle is the following. He says, well, okay, there is... Uh, we observe the very rapid cultural development amongst members of the species Homo sapiens. Huh? There is a very rapid uh, <coughs> cultural development taking place. And this is something that we cannot explain on the basis of uh, evolution as such. We cannot explain that on the basis of uh, the kinds of processes that produce other types of evolutionary change. There must be something else going on there because actually Homo sapiens has been in existence for a relatively short period of time if you look at it on a grand evolutionary uh, plane. So um, how do we explain that? And he says, well, what is the basis of the explanation for that is probably a specific step in cognitive development where you can see that, uh, okay, most, okay, all animals, we can see that they form relations with each other. With, with each other. Uh, if we then look beyond the big mass of mammals to primates, then we see that there is something else going on there. We can see that they not only form relationships amongst each other, but they also conceptualize the relationships that exist between other individuals outside of the self. Now, how can, you observe, how can you make these kinds of statements? Well, you can just by observing behavior. For instance, you can see that if there is a big monkey, a big primate A, which hurts primate B, but primate B is weaker than A, he would be stupid to try to take revenge directly. What does B do? He goes and take, takes revenge through C, who has a special privileged relationship with A. And you can observe these kinds of behavior, which you cannot explain if you, uh, if you do not, cannot imagine that, this, that these primates have conceptualizations of relationships outside of the self. Now, what is the step, the step that is the cognitive step that is taken with Homo sapiens and about which we will never know probably whether it is also not already taken by primates maybe, <laughs> but definitely we know about human beings that what we are able to do is to think about other human beings as minds similar to our own. And that is, it's on the basis of that, that we can make all kinds of hypotheses about what it is that is happening in other people's minds. And that is the very basis of what makes the use of human language as we know it possible. It wouldn't, simply wouldn't be possible without that kind of ability. Okay, so now just a couple of remarks about what I see as the basic structure of a pragmatic theory. Uh, n not, this is not something uh, that I want to propose as the necessary point of reference, but in my own thinking about issues of language use, it has served 
pretty useful purposes because I can usually relate whatever is being said within the field of pragmatics to something that can be put in that kind of framework. Uh, so, the op so what we are dealing with when we're studying language use is, as I said before, what we're interested in is these, these practices of meaning generation. So we generate meanings. That's what we use language for. Now, the central uh, thing that we want to get an understanding of is the dynamics of this, the processes. And these dynamic processes, they are located in relation to aspects of context and structure. So context and structure are very important notions there. Now, these are notion, the notion of context is something that in itself, in fact, requires a very long explanation. Uh, you could devote, uh, well, you could devote a whole course to that. Uh, let me just suffice here to say that what I mean by context, and when, what I mean by context when dealing with issues of language use, is not an outside world which uh, what is happening in language is being related to. No, uh, there is actually almost an ontological relationship between context and structure. For instance, in the sense that as soon as an utterance is made, it becomes part of the context, right? So as soon as an utterance is made, it becomes context. So there is an ontological relationship between the two there. And then as far as aspects of context are concerned that are not themselves linguistic, there is in principle no end to where that context goes. It is aspects of physical context, aspects of social context, aspects of cultural background, aspects of mental processing and so on. So context in essence does not have any limitations. And as such, of course, it is a relatively useless concept <laughs> because, because it is so endless. So you have to reduce it somehow and you reduce it by looking specifically at those aspects of context that are made relevant in a specific form of language use, for instance, in an, in an interaction. And you can look at, those, at the things that are made relevant simply because the making the orientation towards specific aspects of context leaves its formal traces in language use itself. And I'll be getting, getting to some examples of that just, uh, just in a minute. Now, okay, context and structure are very important uh, things. And then there is this here, what I call salience, which is the status of all those processes in relation to the human mind. And that is, for instance, what I refer to uh, when I mentioned reflexivity, metapragmatic awareness, and these kinds of things. Now, but, uh, okay, I'll have to, uh, I cannot spend any more time on this uh, for now. And I hope, okay. So let's get to the problem of implicitness very quickly. Because what I, what I just said about the need for me to make hypotheses about what is happening in your minds, what I just said about that is very directly related to the position that implicit meaning takes in language use. Because implicit meaning is usually that sort of meaning that we can assume that we do not have to make explicit because we can simply attach our utterances to it, because we can assume it to be meaning that is already somehow shared. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of basic observations about, about implicitness. Well, first of all, uh, we all know that there is an impossibility of total explicitness. There is no way in which you can make everything that you want to say totally explicit of course, try to explain an utterance that you make, but then that explanation will be another utterance which requires more explanation, and so on. So, total explicitness is absolutely impossible. But, 
there is also an expectation of implicitness. And uh, that becomes clear, for instance, very nicely in what Jenny also referred to earlier this morning in Harold Garfinkel's breaching experiments. So what Harold Garfinkel did was, he told his students, now go home and whenever somebody says something to you, you start questioning the meaning of what it is that they were saying. And so, for instance, somebody would come home and, and a housemate would say, I'm tired. And then the student, following the instructions of Harold Garfinkel, would say, okay, you're tired. How are you tired? Physically, mentally, or just bored? And then if you have a very cooperative housemate, you might still get a response. And the response might be, I guess, physically mainly. But then, following the instructions, you would go have to go on. And you would say, okay, what does that mean? Do, do your bones hurt? Do you have trouble standing up? Uh, do your muscles hurt? Or something like that. Okay? Now, very soon, if you do that, you get into trouble. Hmm? So your housemate will say, go to hell. Huh? Okay? Now, so there is not only this impossibility of being totally explicit, there is also the expectation of implicitness. It is simply part of the game. Now, there are some related design features of language. First of all, that all languages and probably all utterances use a combination of implicit and explicit meaning. And all languages also have structural means for marking implicit meaning. Now, this is a little bit troublesome, maybe, because there might be such a thing as a pragmatic paradox involved there. Is marked or coded implicit meaning, is that still implicit? Uh, the answer to that is probably no, it's not fully implicit. Huh? Um, and if unmarked, uncoded implicit meaning is the only implicit meaning? Can it still be studied linguistically? There the answer would be, well, if it is totally, fully implicit, no, you cannot study it linguistically. You need linguistic traces to be able to, stud to make a linguistic study of what is going on at the level of implicit meaning. Now, <clears throat> uh, marking implicit meaning includes, for instance, linguistic forms that trigger implicit, mean implicit meanings. And I'll go through a couple of examples of that uh, in a minute. But it can also involve strategies that are involved to convey or to infer implicit meanings. Like, for instance, um, well, simply strategies that are related to the structuring of discourse, like uh, principles of coherence and cohesion and so on. These are all things that are involved in the marking of what is going on at the level of meaning making and more specifically at the level of the interplay between what is said explicitly and what is more implicit. Now, so whenever clear principles are involved, one could speak of coded or marked forms of whenever principles or forms are involved, one could speak of coded or marked forms of implicit meaning in contrast to those that are deriving from mere world knowledge. And now here I'm getting into troubled waters because, of course, in order to understand what an utterance means, very often you have to refer to what is simply world knowledge. And which, is not and which you cannot necessarily find in the form of the utterances that you have in front of you. But what I would what I want to say is, well, okay, you have to take world knowledge into account, but the world knowledge itself is not an object of linguistic investigation as such, because linguistic investigation stops at the moment where you can no, no longer refer to linguistic signals that you can somehow describe. Now, but world knowledge is of course important and I'll just give you a very quick example of that. So at the time in the 19th century when um, mostly Europeans were exploring uh, all corners of the world, they also went to places that no normal human being would want to go to, like the North Pole, for instance. Now, um, okay, uh, they ran into creatures there that they didn't meet elsewhere, like, for instance, polar bears. 
And then you got all kinds of traveler stories. So like for instance, one of the stories would be that those polar bears, well, they are really, really very smart animals. Because when they are sneaking up to their prey, they cover their nose. Now, uh, let's well leave aside the fact that this is not true. They, they don't do any such thing. But you have no problem understanding this story. In spite of the fact that what you need to understand this story doesn't even come up in what I'm saying. So what is it that you need to understand this story? What you need is, is, is your, your basic image of a polar bear. This one, right? So that's what you need. And what do you see? Ah, you see a nose that sticks out against the white background because it is black. But then, of course, yes, the polar bear has to be very smart in order to, well, if it covers its nose when sneaking up to a prey, right? So the issue of color doesn't come up in the story that I'm telling, but you have no trouble really understanding understanding the story because you have this image of the polar bear. And so that, that's pure world knowledge that you bring into, into the use of language. And so a lot of language use and a lot of storytelling, certainly, you will not be able to understand unless there is this, this background knowledge that you can simply make, make use of. And so in an analysis of discourse and of narrative, well, of course, you have to take this fully into account. But that world knowledge itself is not the object of the linguistic analysis as such, right? So you have to know where the, the limits are of what it is that you are exactly doing and uh, so on. Okay, let's go on. Now, I'm just really going to skip over this. I wanted to go, um, but uh, this will take too much time. I wanted to go over a whole bunch of examples of markers of implicitness. There are lots of, lots of, um, uh, <clears throat> there are lots of categories of analysis that are available in the pragmatic literature to talk about such issues. Like for instance, okay, there is the, there is the problem of uh, referential indeterminacy. Um, there is the problem of semantic ambiguity. There is the, uh, the issue of, sem of semantic incompleteness. Like, for instance, if you use a simple adjective like tall, then you have to know by what scale this is tall, which makes it so strange, for instance, that the smallest cup of coffee you get in uh, Starbucks is tall. <laughs> now, <clears throat> OK, so um, then, there is, uh, then there are imp logical implications, like uh, John is the vice chancellor implicates that John is a vice chancellor. You've got entailments. There is a whole lot of discussion about entailments that, that we could go into, but I, that I won't go into. There is such a thing that is, goes under the label of conventional implicature. So when you say John is smart but reliable, then in fact this has exactly the same truth conditions as when you would be saying John is smart and reliable, but there is more involved, the but, introduces a form of contrast which suggests incompatibility between these things. So in fact, what, you're, what, is, Im, what is implicated there is that uh, being smart and being reliable often doesn't go together. Hmm? Now, uh, there are masses of types of presuppositions. Like, uh, just well, just have a look at, at thing, simple things like, uh, change of state verb, it stopped raining. That presupposes that it was raining before. Um, verbs, of, verbs of judging, John blamed Mary for missing the lecture. So this not only presupposes that Mary missed the lecture, but furthermore it also presupposes that the speaker thinks that missing the lecture was a bad thing. Hmm? So a whole lot of presupposed information that is carried by specific linguistic forms. And if you want to get a good overview of those things, you have lots and lots of examples in, in uh, Steve Levinson's classic 
textbook on pragmatics, which uh, Rukmini failed to read when it was hot. <laughs> so now, okay, so um, so you find lots and lots of examples there. So it's a good good reference work for finding many more examples. This is just a continuation of all of that, and just see what happens when when you get a more complex sentence like this one here, for instance. We're all aware that the free market, which dictates the economy, may cease to function someday. Well, this is loaded with presuppositions. So, so uh, we're aware that presupposes the factuality of what you're going to say. The free market ha carries an existential presupposition. You have to assume that there is such a thing as the free market, which we all know there isn't. But uh, but still, we work very often in the economy in the economy on the assumption that there is. Then, which dictate, dictates the economy? Well, this uh, relative clause uh, presupposes the truth of what is what is being said there. So that in fact, this free market dictates the economy. Sees the function. Uh, presupposes that it has stopped functioning. And then there is a whole lot of other things that are not so much presuppositional, but also forms of implicit meaning that are also there. Like when you say something like, we're all aware that the all never in a context like this refers to every individual that you can imagine. Hmm? No, it is a rhetorical strategy that you use there. Uh, may, may cease to exist indicates that you're not entirely certain that this will that this this will happen and so on so this is loaded with forms of implicit meaning which are all somehow marked so you can analyze them you can analyze them on the basis of the traces that you find in the linguistic form then <clears throat> Then there, is, uh, there are things such as uh, the whole literature on indirect speech acts. There are, there is, there are the conversational implicature examples that, uh, well, and I think uh, Rukmini will say more about conversational implicature in her next talk, where what is happening is that, um, just to give you a very brief introduction, okay, to give you a very brief introduction, um, <clears throat> Okay, if somebody has run out of gas, out of petrol, and uh, asks uh, and sees a passerby and wants to find out where petrol can be found, he may say something very simple like, I'm out of petrol. Hmm? So, which is not a question of any sort, no, but you simply assume that this, well, you simply assume on the basis of a very general principle of conversational cooperation that if somebody says something, this is meant to be relevant in the context. So, the person uh, A meets is probably going to understand this correctly. Um, this is going, going to understand that this is a person who needs gas, who needs to find petrol, hmm? not just a statement that he's out of petrol. And then if you have a co oh, sorry, and then if you have a cooperative uh, passerby, then he may say something like, "There is a garage around the corner." Now, again, this is a statement that doesn't say anything about petrol, that doesn't say anything explicitly about what it is that A needs to know, but this wouldn't, but then the principles, the maxims of conversation, since they are obviously breached in the sense that this seems to be irrelevant, you have a breach of a principle like that, but at the same time you still believe in the, in the very general principle of cooperation and the combination of those two lead to interpretations that are the correct ones here, like, okay, this is going to mean at the same time that <clears throat> the garage around the corner has petrol for sale and that it is probably open, right? Okay, uh, but, okay, I'm not going to go into these issues and not going to go into the theoretical issues surrounding this because this is a, an entirely uh, well, field that we could say a lot more about. Other things that are related to the whole issue of implicit uh, meaning versus explicit meaning uh, are to be found in the range of 
instances of figurative language. You've got metaphor, metonymy, irony, and so on. I know some people here are extremely interested in those things, but again, I don't have the time now to explore this further. Other examples of figurative language. Now, from an adaptability uh, perspective, there is a little bit of a uh, paradox of the binary contrast between explicit and implicit in the sense that explicitness somehow, in most of the descriptions of what goes on, that in the descriptions, explicitness is very often felt to be the norm. And then the descriptions that you get, in spite of the fact that, that explicitness is, as we all know, unattainable, still the descriptions that you get are very often going to be formulated in the form of deviations from the norm of explicitness. Now, <clears throat> therefore, talking about explicit and implicit uh, as a bipolar contrast is definitely misleading, and it is much more useful to think about it as a gradable, gradable scale, much more, so talk about it as a gradable phenomenon that results from the constant calibration that you get between more explicit and more implicit elements of interactive generation, uh, generation of meaning. So what this is all about, well, okay, what we're dealing with there is very dynamic processes. So it is not strict categories that you're dealing with. No, it is essentially very dynamic processes you're dealing with. Processes that could be labeled under the general term of contextual indexing. So contextual indexing is a very general term that you can use to refer to all those elements in language that signal a specific relationship with contextual information that is not being made explicit. Okay? So, uh, well, contextual indexing also takes place when you do make it explicit, but a whole lot of it is really implicit. Now, <clears throat> okay, so then now I get to uh, what I really wanted to focus on, because most of what I've been saying now, well, you can, you can read up on it, and, and there is a whole lot of literature in which you can find, find all of that. But let me try to uh, say something about a notion that uh, I think may become useful in talking about processes of meaning generation in language use. Now, the main issue there is, uh, well, in the face of the adaptable and gradable calibration of implicit versus uh, explicit, sorry for the, for the printing error, uh, so what is the meaning of meaning, really, in a theory of pragmatics? Uh, or how do we cope with all the dynamics that is involved there? And I will only uh, be able to make a few suggestions towards an answer to that uh, uh, question. <clears throat> now, uh, I don't know whether you recognize this. this is, without the glasses, this would be Socrates. Now, uh, with the glasses, with the glasses, this is Daniel Dennett, who was also quoted by, who was quoted by uh, Rukmini this morning. Now, why do I project uh, an image of Daniel Dennett? Uh, well, for the very simple reason that, um, okay, what I what I said here, namely, how do we cope with the dynamics of what's involved? Even very smart people like Daniel Dennett, hmm, very often seem to be thinking about meaning in terms of something that is stable. And uh, I'll just give you an example of that. Hmm. So I, I just quote from a recent book of his, where, namely the book uh, that appeared in 2017, From Bacteria to Bach and Bach, The Evolution of Minds. I quote, Jacques shoots his uncle dead in Trafalgar Square and is apprehended on the spot by Sherlock. Tom reads about it in The Guardian and Boris learns of it in Pravda. Now Jacques, Sherlock, Tom and Boris have had remarkably different experiences, but there is one thing they share, semantic information to the effect that a Frenchman has committed a murder in Trafalgar Square. They did not all, not all say this, not even to themselves, 
that proposition did not, we can suppose, occur to any of them. And even if it had, it would have had very different import for Jacques, Sherlock, Tom, and Boris. They share no encoding, but they do share semantic information. So somehow, it, somehow Daniel, Daniel Dennett here seems to suggest that, um, that there is such a thing as a stable form of meaning that is being, that is being uh, communicated there and that is being understood by the different people involved. Now, um, <clears throat> the, well, let me see here. So, uh, well, that was my phone, I think. But um, so, oh, I'm missing a page here. So he seems to really suggest that the meaning somehow can be presented as something that is independent of its encoding, and that is something that, from a point of view of Linguistic pragmatics is extremely problematic. So most of us would hopefully agree that the story that is read by Tom in the Guardian and the story read by Boris in Pravda probably uh, do not carry exactly the same meaning, not only in terms of different import for Tom and Boris, but that there is a lot more involved there. And coping with meaning generation processes is a highly complex uh, task, <clears throat> even though there is, of course, a natural tendency to divide this complex task in terms of a number of work packages, so to speak. And also within the field of pragmatics, there has for a long time been, been a tendency to define such work packages that somehow reduce the complexity of what goes on. And now I go to, well, this other philosopher here, which is Paul Grice, right? And uh, so many, many, yes, it's not a very clear picture, but it's him. Huh? <laughs> now, um, so Grice's view of meaning is very familiar to many of you, I'm sure. But it is it's worth repeating here very briefly. Uh, so according to Grice, <clears throat> meaning can be defined as the speaker's intention in the making of an utterance to produce an effect in the hearer by means of the hearer's recognition of the intention to produce that effect. Now, what is happening there? Well, what is happening there at one specific level is that meaning is being detached from language. It is located in individual intentionality. That's where meaning is located according to this, this definition. And a problem with that is that if you take this definition seriously and really want to carry its, its uh, implications to the extreme, you cannot talk about any form of meaning that is unintentional. So the only significant meaning to talk about would be intentional. And the problem is that if you really start thinking about real everyday forms of interaction, um, for instance, think about whatever forms of what Malinowski would call fatic communi communion, um, so where people are just chit-chatting with each other, uh, what people say is they're interpreted in a variety of ways which where the question very often doesn't even come up whether somebody meant a specific utterance in a specific way. Hmm? Meanings are generated all the time in ways that are unintentional. That also happens in very formal contexts. Like for instance, okay, if I'm, if I'm giving this lecture here, so you are bringing so many backgrounds into this that if, well, okay, for one thing, uh, maybe it is not even all that clear in my mind what it is that I mean, <laughs> right? So I'm also struggling with meaning, right? Uh, especially when I talk about a topic like this. 
but my talking about the topic of meaning would probably not even be very successful if it was got stuck at the level of what could be identified as my individual intentionality. Now, you are bringing in lots of backgrounds that enrich whatever it is that I'm trying to say, right? Um, <clears throat> so, we have to, so in fact, if we take the step of taking meaning beyond, uh, well, if detaching meaning from language, then we have to keep going. And we have to say we have to go all the way. We do not only have to take in intentionality, no, we also have to take in the full complexity of what I earlier referred to as context. Taking into account the fact that context is not something that's out there, but that is interactively made relevant. Okay? So, but you have to go much further than intentionality. There are lots of other contextual phenomena that that play an equally important role in the production of meaning in, in language use. And so, and then we get into this whole field of contextual indexing, which I used as a label before to refer to this interplay that takes place between, <coughs> between uh, explicit and implicit uh, forms of meaning making. Um, but if we go in that direction, then it means that the whole field of meaning, from a pragmatic point of view, becomes extremely unstable. In fact, I'm just repeating in other words what I started out with uh, when I said, for instance, that meaning is negotiable. It is permanently negotiable. It's a very unstable kind of, kind of phenomenon. It has to be worked on uh, permanently. And that is why I'm beginning to think that it, is, it may be very useful to start thinking about meaning from a pragmatic point of view in terms of a very general notion of meaning potential. So the potentiality that is involved. Now, that of course makes the field relatively uh, messy hmm? uh, because we are really getting into a very un unstable field and then the problem becomes now how can we still cope with all the dynamics that is going on there. <clears throat> and, okay, <clears throat> so in order to get an understanding of the meaning-making dynamics that is involved, we must realize that there are three uh, abilities underlying processes of interactively generating meanings by means of language. And the first, um, Ability is very simply the ability to capture the world in categories. So, at first sight, when we enter the world, it is just this blur of phenomena, right? Uh, but we are capable of reducing that blur to a more interpretable mass by categorizing phenomena. Hmm? And it is that ability to, uh, to capture the world in, in categories, that is the first ability that we need <clears throat> to understand how we get to language. And this is then, for, well, categories, for instance, are reflected in the lexicon of languages and so on. <clears throat> Second, there is the ability to understand relations between categorized entities, for instance, in, in terms of state, states or events, and that's where the whole grammatical apparatus that has been developed in languages comes in to, uh, to talk about these relationships between categorized entities. And then third, <clears throat> there is the ability, and I talked about that earlier, the ability to grasp what happens in other people's minds. And I'm not going to repeat what I said about that earlier. Now, the problem is, <clears throat> that one and two are always approximative. So our categorizations of the world can be vastly different, which is also why, for instance, lexical fields in different languages don't match each other at all. So there is a wide variety of lexical fields uh, different structuring of lexical fields, even dealing with very similar phenomena in different languages. So, uh, so 
the categorization is always approximative because you cannot make a full-scale, solid categorization of things in the world that would work for everybody. Hmm? Well, you, for one thing, you would need too many categories. Hmm? Well, you would have to make too many distinctions. And making categories means reducing the complexity. It means lumping things together, right? And that can be done in so many different ways. Okay. Now, as to the understand, as to relation, sorry, as to relations between <clears throat> between categorized entities. Well, okay, all the, this grammatical apparatus that's being developed in different languages also works in very different ways in different languages. And so again. Re establishing relationships between categorized entities is also something that can always only be approximative. And then three, the ability to grasp what happens in other people's minds, as I already said before, is always purely hypothetical, right? That's always hypothetical. <clears throat> so that means that the processes that we're talking about, they must be dynamic. And I repeat the terms I used earlier, Vari variability comes in, negotiability comes in, adaptability is involved. And one central aspect of adaptable meaning generating dynamics being the contextual indexing involved, integratable interaction between implicit and explicit aspects of meaning. Now, what I've been saying so far, there is not much that is new there. So for one thing, focusing on gradeability uh, is not something new in linguistics. Uh, gradeability is, is a, f a phenomenon that comes in in, in, in various fields. Even uh, very recently in a book that uh, Sandra Duranti wrote about intentionality, he even talks about, a, about an intentionality continuum. Huh? Uh, so the, the degree to which intentionality is important for a form of interaction may vary according to specific institutional contexts and so on. So that's, that's a gradable phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> uh, when you think about um, evidentiality, so the, the, the way in which evidence is, is signaled in linguistic forms, well, there is a whole lot of gradation there from uh, from things that you can that you have wit witnessed yourself to things that are purely hearsay and things like that. So there is a lot of grad gradability involved all the time. Also, the term of meaning potential. Uh, okay, I I did a search and I found that, for instance, Halliday also use the meaning of uh, meaning potential. He uses it in a slightly different way, which I cannot go into the details of that, but it's not a new term. It's, so, in fact, I'm not introducing anything new here. But, and, and, and what I can, and, and this is also, what I'm trying to say is also very much related to, um, to the theory of affordances, which comes from perceptual psychology where, uh, well, the, the term affordances were, was launched in perceptual psychology to refer to um, phenomena such as, uh, okay, the phenomena related to the relationship between living beings and their environment. Mm -hmm. And the, the way in which the same environment creates potential possibilities affordances for different living beings is totally different. So if you have a very rocky, steep terrain, for instance, this provides different affordances for a mountain goat than for me, for instance. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's also a notion that uh, is within the theory of affordances also related to what happens in, in language use, actually. So even relating it to, to language use is not something new that I'm doing. But what I'm try going to try and do now for the rest of my, my presentation is, first of all, uh, try to show um, well, okay, I'm going to skip this because this is a little bit, well, no, I can't skip it. I need it. So there are different levels of potentiality that we have to keep in, in mind. Uh, first of all, there is a very undifferentiated level of context in its very widest sense 
where meaning is indeed only present in its potentiality, but that is a level that we are not going to deal with when we're doing linguistics, basically. Um, <clears throat> then there is a second level where you get perceptually and organizationally more differentiated context, and for lack of a better term, I would now call that the level of environmental affordances. Um, then there is a third level, which is the language-related affordances provided by very specific linguistic tools. And so uh, what I will try to do is give some illustrations of on that third level. So talk about language-related affordances that are provided by specific linguistic tools, and then also say something about what happens once uh, <clears throat> specific forms have become available with their specific affordances and what happens then when they get used because they can still still get used in a variety of ways. So the, the, the flexibility doesn't stop anywhere. Now the easiest way to talk about this is by talking, uh, by giving examples that are contrastive. Because if you contrast comparable elements in different languages and you see the different potential that they create or the similar potential they create by different means, then you can, can get a better idea of what the phenomena are that are involved. Let me first start with a very simple thing related to the affordances of available tools. Now, okay. This is an advertisement of, uh, well, which is part of the, of an anti-smoking campaign, an Irish anti, an Irish anti-smoking campaign. And the, actually the, uh, the baseline of the whole campaign is, I don't know if you can see it well in the background there, but that's this line here, break the habit for good. So that's the baseline, stop smoking, break the habit for good. Now, the very simple fact <clears throat> that in English, you have an expression available, which is breaking a habit, creates certain possibilities for the people who make this, who try to make this advertisement in this anti-smoking campaign. Uh, one of the things that becomes immediately possible is to t take this literally and to get this image here of the broken cigarette. So you get the image of the broken cigarette. And then you can take a further step, which is also taken here. Namely, ah, this broken cigarette can take the shape of a V. Ah, that fits very nicely in the word save. So save a fortune. So. What I'm trying to say is the availability of a specific expression, breaking a habit in English, makes it very easy for the designer of this advertisement to focus on the, uh, <clears throat> on the saving aspect of stopping a smoking habit, right? I'm not saying that you couldn't focus on that without the availability of that specific linguistic tool but it facilitates. There is, there is a level of affordance there. And this becomes clear also when you then look at similar advertisements in other languages, like uh, here is one from Germany. So in Germany, where you have, uh, where the top line says, Rauchen macht stark, literally translated into English, that means smoking makes strong. Now, that's not the kind of thing that you expect in an anti-smoking campaign. So, what follows, what follows is, is important. Oh, sorry. What follows is important, namely, stark abhängig, strongly dependent, just like heroin, ähnlich wie heroin, just like heroin. How does German facilitate the focus on the addictive qualities of smoking in an anti-smoking campaign, the very simple fact that the same form of a word can be used as an adjective and an adverb. In English, you can't make this work because, because 
Okay, here you have Stark and Stark. It's exactly the same form. In English, you would have to have strongly, and okay, the, the, the rhythm would be broken. Okay, so, <clears throat> but these are, these are very simple examples, and again, I'm not trying to say that you couldn't achieve the same effects by different means, yes, but you would have to have the different means available also. Okay, so specific linguistic means create specific possibilities. Now, if you um, <clears throat> look then at the contrastive realization of meaning potential, um, well, the two, just a couple more phrases that are theoretical, the rest is all going to be practical examples. Huh? Now, <clears throat> the perceptually and organizationally differentiated context at the level of environmental affordances, level two of potentiality, provides the unstable and malleable raw material of meaning potential from which, at level three, sedimented realization patterns, this is important, sedimented realization patterns are forged into the shape of concrete linguistic tools. If you were to ask me today to give a definition of language, then my definition would be <clears throat> language is a conglomerate of sedimented realization patterns of meaning potential. That's my definition, okay? Now, <clears throat> then at level three, those sedimented realization patterns in turn provide further meaning, meaning potential. So not only can the patterns differ, but once available, patterns also lead to contrastive forms of usage. And it is those two things that I want to further illustrate. So how the patterns differ and how uh, available patterns can also be uh, lead to contrastive forms of use. First example, <clears throat> negative versus uh, uh, positive constructions. You find them in most languages, I suppose, but the forms that are available for negative versus positive constructions, they vary a bit. Like for instance, the typical English negative construction would be subject, auxiliary, negative marker, verb. I do not smoke. Hmm? Now, in other languages like Dutch or German, you do not need the auxiliary there, but only the negative marker. So, ik hoek niet, I literally smoke not. That's all I need. Now, in French, in still other languages, uh, you can have more than one marker. And sometimes this is uh, subject to uh, diachronic development, of course, like in French, for instance, which started out in the 15th, 16th century, we find just one negative marker, je ne dis, and then after, well, between 1600 and 1700, it become, well, the uh, second marker, pas, is added to it, ne pas, so a double negative marker. This becomes standard written French afterwards, then in standard spoken French, already you can drop the first element, and in colloquial French, the first element is usually totally dropped. So, so these things also vary uh, quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> just looking then at the way in which positive and negative constructions are actually used, um, and if you look at that contrastively, well, okay, I'm going to take an example here from uh, an issue of The Economist, The World in 2013, where an article about the British economy starts out with the sentence, it is easy to despair of the British economy. Hmm? Now, the same issue of The Economist was also published in a number of other languages, including French. And the French version, the, the, first, the same first line says, il ne faut pas, pas du, il faut bien du courage pour ne pas désespérer de l'économie britannique, literally translated, one really needs courage, not the despair of the British economy. Hmm? Now, clearly, there is a perspective reversal taking place there. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, the question that emerges then there is, well, is this simply a matter of an individual's style? Or is this something that is forced upon the translator 
by certain properties of the French language? To what extent is it possible to have a directly literal translation in French? Yes, it is possible, but how likely is it to get that? Um, and then finally, the question is now, if you get a text in which you find similar kinds of differences throughout a text, what is going to be the effect on the meaning that is interpreted by the readers? What is going to be the effect on the interpretation of this text for the French audience versus the English-speaking audience? And that is an issue that I think ultimately, as pragmaticians, we should get a grip on, right? Now, <clears throat> so other types of examples. So if you look in the field of evidentials, for instance, well, you have many cases where in different languages, similar means have similar potential. Like for instance, ye, you have the speculative use of the French future, il aura fait son choix, literally, he will, uh, <clears throat> he will have made his choice. Uh, but in English, you can also translate it literally by saying he will have made his choice with the same meaning. But this is then the meaning that has to be, he has probably made his choice. That's what it means. But here you have the possibility to have it literally translated into English with the same meaning. Okay. Now, if you look at other examples, like where you get similar means but with different potential, like when you get the hearsay evidential usage of the French conditional, il aurait choisi la mort, he would have chosen death. Hmm? Uh, that's the literal translation. Well, you cannot really use that as a literal equivalent in English for the same meaning. The meaning being, he is said to have chosen death. Okay. Now, then if you look at other languages, like I'm taking an example here from Eli Fantidou, uh, from Greek, where you have this evidential marker, taha, which can be, which means something like supposedly, which can be used in a declarative form, uh, but it can also be used in an interrogative form. Um, is he supposedly leaving? It's, it's a little bit... Uh, a difficult translation there, you would rather translate it as, is he perhaps leaving, something like that. But you can also use the same evidential marker in an, in an imperative. And there it becomes totally difficult to find a good equivalent uh, <clears throat> for what is being meant there. Now, taha is apparently a very weak evidential marker, which takes away the, some of the speaker's responsibility for what they're saying. Hmm? So what this, what this imperative could mean is something like, yeah, go, but I really don't want you to go, something like that. Um, and, and, you, and as equivalents in English, you could, you could find things like, if in a very irritated way you would say, go then, something like that. Or, mm, um, or perhaps go, something like, the, the, but then the, the question is, do these things really mean the same thing as in the, in, in, with this evidential marker in, uh, in, in Greek? Now, <clears throat> so, and then if you start looking at how different evidentials get used in actual, actual discourse, then you see some very interesting phenomena again. From the same text, from the same issue of The Economist, you get this uh, sentence in, in English. Britain may have one of the worst performing economies among the G7, but, and so on. This is translated into French as certes. La Grande-Bretagne a l'une des économies les moins performantes du G7, uh, G7, <laughs> mais, etc. Now, okay. This means, certainly, that's not the same as may have. So actually, on the scale of the available tools, they are opposites. So one, one indicates possibility, the other indicates certainty. And still, within the wider, wider context, especially with this concessive structure, con the concessive argumentative structure that is marked by but and by me, they 
well, in terms of meaning, they may become more or less equivalent, um, but still there is a different degree of certainty involved here, if for no other reason, because of the very definitive uh, verbal form, has. Not just may have, but has. Has one of the worst performing economies. So, <clears throat> again, the uh, question is what is, the, what is the overall effect of an accumulation of these kinds of differences when you try to uh, be involved in some form of international communication, you know? So, in, in the field of international communication, these are very important issues to, that come up. Now, nominalization, another example, just quickly. So the nominalization is a process, well, no, let me skip nominalization because, no, I can't skip it. <laughs> nominalization, there are different possibilities of nominalizing, which means of packing together complex content into a simplified nominal structure. Now, in, for instance, in um, Japanese, there is Apparently, a well, okay, you have here a Japanese example which literally translated would mean the, the daytime having become longer, and there is a nominalizer, that's the nominalizer. So, the daytime having become longer, which is the subject of a sentence, the sentence then being, well, also was not hidden. How is that translated into English? But the days had obviously grown longer. Now, actually, what is the, main, what is the meaning of the main clause in the Japanese uh, utterance is captured simply by the adverb in, uh, in the English version. And again, so you have different means available. And then the most important thing is, of course, how do different means get used differently? I don't have any Japanese examples there to contrast with. But again, <clears throat> from the same issue of The Economist, in an article about China, you get this enor enormously long nominalized structure uh, consolidating his grip, and his then refers to Xi Jinping, huh? uh, consolidating his grip over an 80 million member Communist Party amid growing frustration in China over the lethargic pace of economic and political reform will tax him greatly. <sighs> okay, a, a, mass, a mass of information that's packed into a nominalized structure which becomes the subject of a, of a verb. Now, again, in, in French, this looks very different. So in French, it starts out, il y pouvra, he, he will experience. And so he's still an experiencer there. Hmm? who undergo certain things, but by putting him in the agent slot there, you, well, his active involvement becomes stronger. And again, as an individual example, this wouldn't mean all that much, but then if in the same text you see these, you see these things coming up again and again, like um, <clears throat> healing the party's own ailments will also be a tough task for Mr. C. In French it is, Mr. C aura aussi la tâche délicate, etc. So you, you, this, this pattern, there seems to be a regularity in the way in which there is different usage of, of patterns. And again, I repeat the question I've been asking before, namely, what is the overall effect of this? Um, I I'm probably will have to stop. We started 10 minutes late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I can. What we we'll do is we'll all quickly get and coffee cups here so that we have a good half an hour for discussion. Uh huh, okay. Uh, yes, okay. Okay, and I'll try to finish as fast as possible. I can probably do it in the next 10 minutes, yes. Uh, complex syntax. Another another one of those those phenomena. And I'm, I'm just. I'm just uh, collecting these examples from the pragmatic literature, you know, the literature is full of them, um, <clears throat> where you have similar means with different distribution, different potential maybe. Now, complex syntax in the work of Nier and Berman refers to 
clauses that are linked syntactically as clause packages, uh, presenting different phases of an event as a single event complex. And these, this complex syntax can take different forms, and it's not important to understand exactly what all these terms mean, but you can have have isolated clauses, which is referred to as isotaxis. You can have a stringing of clauses. You can make uh, the stringing dependent. You can have a layering of clauses. You can have a nesting of clauses. Uh, don't mind the ter terminology and, and what it all refers to concretely at this moment. What is important is the following. Namely, in their comparison of discourse, in a number of different languages, here, French, Hebrew, English, Spanish, the first thing they did was to look at the average, uh, <clears throat> the average number of clauses that are packaged together. And you see significant differences, right? So for French, it would be three. For Spanish, it would go up to five. Uh, in similar types of discourse that they are investigating. And then even more importantly, so the distribution of the different packaging types is significantly different. So for those different languages. And uh, again, you might, might think, well, okay, now what's the significance of this? But then if you start looking at these phenomena in very concrete examples, like uh, I did a very quick look at <clears throat> Well, sorry, this is so unclear. Um, at the number of linguistic abstracts uh, that were sent in for uh, a conference a year or so ago. Um, <clears throat> and you look at abstracts from the USA, sorry, it's so unclear, the US, from China, from Europe. And you look at the different forms of uh, clause packaging that you get in those abstracts you get totally different patterns there. Totally different patterns. And this is one of, the, one of the phenomena that is possibly also responsible for the difficulty of uh, people from outside a mainstream uh, Western uh, academic writing style to get papers accepted in their journals, for instance. Now, or to get abstracts accepted for conferences. Now, and it is an awareness of these kinds of differences that, um, well, that is very important to develop. And it's very important to also get an understanding of what exactly the effect of those differences <clears throat> is. There are lots of methodological challenges there, and I told you I'm not going to talk about methodology here, but <clears throat> at the level of sedimentation, there is the problem of assessing the position which a specific structural choice occupies in relation to other possibilities. At the level of usage, there is an assessment of the likelihood that specific choices will be interpreted in a specific way or will influence interpretations in a more or less specifiable way. Now, methodolo developing methodologies to get answers to these questions, well, that is a very important challenge that we're facing now. <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> okay, this is as far as I go today. So I wanted to say a little bit more about how we can try to, <clears throat> to map the kinds of meaning differences that emerge in relation to specific, the usage of specific linguistic forms and things like that. But that's for <clears throat> another time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>